Good afternoon all and thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Paul Marshall. Um, our session today is on the importance of ESG, that's environmental, social and corporate governance. Um, I'm Paul Marshall. I'm a partner with the GRC team, that's Government Regulation and Competition in Brodies. The speakers with me today are James Millward, a senior associate within the team, and Katie Lovis lister in the team. And you'll hear from James and Katie in a moment. We're going to be talking about what is ESG, the latest developments in ESG, and hopefully we'll leave you with some practical advice on what you can do now to meet the challenge of ESG. So looking at our agenda, you'll see we're going to deal with ESG, why it matters, the benefits of having strong ESG credentials, the view coming from investors and regulators on ESG at present, Europe and what's happening next in Europe and where does the UK fit in in all of this. So that's our session. We hope you enjoy it. I'll pass over to James now to start the presentation and I'll come back in to chair the Q&A session at the end. Over to you, James. Thanks, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. Before we launch into an overview of ESG related regulations and some practical steps on implementing an ESG framework, I thought it would be helpful just to step back and ask what exactly is ESG? What are we going to be talking about? Well, ESG stands for environmental, social and governance, but more importantly, ESG as we know it is a set of performance indicators. Companies are now given ESG ratings by ratings agencies and investors. And consumers, of course, are using ESG ratings to evaluate the ethical behavior of companies, as well as determining their future financial performance. So what do we mean then by ESG? Well, on the slide here, <coughs> excuse me, on the slide here, we have broken down ESG into the three specific areas of operative risk. The environmental banner captures indicators such as waste, pollution, natural resource conservation, deforestation, and approach to climate change. Sorry, forgive me. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. The S covers social issues such as equality, employee welfare and safety, of course, human rights, diversity, and the general approach to, to sourcing materials. For example, do you have an intolerance to uh, slave labor or forced labor. And the G is the overarching uh, limb here and relates to how a company is governed. It captures such areas as tax strategy, executive remuneration, board diversity and structure, as well as having an approach to accurate and transparent accounting methods. I think there's a lot of evidence uh, now that the corporate world is increasingly recognizing that it makes good business sense to focus on these ESG areas. And we can see as ESG issues gain prominence, as they move up the agenda of regula regulators, it's going to become more and more expensive to be a polluting company or a company which prioritizes, say, short term profit over supply chain welfare. Higher taxes, higher fines are just a couple of obvious ways that governments can uh, encourage companies to, or discourage companies from behaving in a certain way. This presentation is going to focus on the benefits of ESG and how to construct a meaningful ESG program. We're gonna try and frame it in a positive way. So we're looking at giving you tips um, uh, and, and how to get started. So let's take a look at what may happen to a company which gets it wrong just before we begin that very positive uh, um, approach. So on the next slide, we have a couple of uh, recent headlines of ESG events from various industries. Boohoo up in the top left there. Boohoo fashion giant faces slavery investigation. Last year, as I'm sure many of you will remember, Boohoo was reported to be facing a modern slavery investigation after it transpired that uh, workers that it was using in Leicester were being paid £3.50. In the UK this year, the living wage is £9.50. So there were um, uh, headlines like this and, and more incendiary ones. 
no company wants to be associated with a headline which has slavery in it. And it goes further than that because there is a real prospect that Boohoo will be banned from exporting goods to the United States as it is illegal uh, in the US to import goods which derive from slave labor. In the top right, another headline uh, revealed how Tesco fueled record-breaking fires in Brazil's wetlands. Tesco recently got into hot water following a Greenpeace investigation, which identified that it, as well as other supermarkets and fast food companies, was sourcing their meat from one of the world's largest meat processors, JBS. Uh, and JBS had sourced that meat from uh, slaughter slaughtered cattle, which had been produced by rangers who had cleared valuable wetland in, in the Brazilian Pantanal by starting fires. And that's a pretty good example, I think, of why it's not only necessary to look at your business, but to look at the supply chain and try and identify a way that you can you can vet your supply chain if you're in the same sort of industry as Tesco and you're procuring goods, uh, raw products from well down the line. And then finally, the bottom left, I'm sure many of you will remember in 2019 when Greenpeace staged a protest at BP, uh, BP's headquarters in London. What they had done was they had craned in great big giant crates to block the main doors of the of the office. Um, these crates had activists in, um, and I understand from reading the, the newspapers that the activists had box sets and food and were prepared for the for the long haul. And other activists had scaled buildings around uh, BP's HQ and then started to unfurl banners reading reading climate emergency. I mean, I suppose it goes without saying that if you if you operate in the oil and gas sector, it's not just the oil and gas sector, but it 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 is a way of um, it, it's sort of risk which you have to deal with. It is a way of doing business. There are going to be activists who who mount protests, and just the reference here to to BP, I think, raises an interesting point F for us. I mean, in our experience, companies which operate in these traditionally less ethical sectors such as oil and gas, tobacco and pharmaceuticals are often the companies which actually have the strongest ESG credentials. And I suppose one of the, and one of the most recent examples of that is the approach AstraZeneca has taken to, um, to selling its, its COVID, vac COVID vaccine at cost price. So now I'm gonna hand over to, to, Kate, to Katie who will look a little bit at uh, the tangible benefits of getting your ESG messaging and framework spot on. Thanks, James. Um, as mentioned, we're going to try to look at this from a, a positive point of view and have a look at the benefits of developing and fostering um, strong ESG credentials. Now, this slide summarises some of the key benefits that we consider to be relevant you know, across, the, across various sectors. Um, in terms of taking ESG seriously and getting it right. So to start with, um, as an obvious point, it protects the brand and the brand's reputation. And now corporate image, certainly on the marketplace and towards consumers is very important. And there's no doubt now that with the market and consumers being much more sustainably minded and there being a bigger emphasis around things like employee wellbeing, diversity and, um, and other um, social and governance issues that might not have been as prevalent you know, in the previous decade. Um, it's much more important now to be able to present your company to the market as a ESG conscious and ESG driven entity, whether that be from the uh, environmental side, the social side or the governance side. Um, it also helps to maintain and renew licenses if your company has positive ESG messaging and has an ESG orientated operational base, this will assist the company in obtaining and maintaining um, uh, production licenses, waste management licenses, and other such things from regulators. You know, some, some of these licenses have very stringent environmental requirements and to be able to demonstrate that you have a strong environmental policy, environmental compliance, 
will only bolster your position when it comes to dealing with the regulators and maintaining these important licenses. Um, we'll cover this in some more detail when we move through the presentation, but sustainable ESG investing is on the up by developing strong ESG policies and a culture specifically in your business. This will make the company much more attractive to investors. Another benefit is that your business is more likely to be viewed as a desirable business partner. And whether that's in terms of uh, a joint venture or via a tendering process is something to be borne in mind. Indeed, some of um, the ESG related breaches that we've seen recently you know, around modern slavery or money laundering offences may result in your company actually being barred from tendering processes. So it's important to, to keep this high in the corporate agenda. And of course, finally, from a practical point of view, strong ESG commitment and compliance helps to mitigate the risk of being subject to enforcement action. This might be from um, you know, the health and safety executive, SEPA, the FCA, the OGA, depending on what sector you're operating in. Um, but all of these operate, or all these regulators, sorry, will look at factors that slot into the ESG broader matrix. And so by prioritizing employee safety, environmental protection, um, good corporate compliance and proper accounting practices will all stand you and your company in good stead to avoiding such enforcement action. I think the crux of it is that there's a strong commercial reason for developing an ESG strategy to bolster your company's profile. So these are some of the internal factors that we think might be, might be viewed as positives from an entity's point of view. And I'll now pass back to James, who will have a look at some of the external factors that might influence a company's view of ESG. Brilliant. Thanks, Katie. So I think Katie's illustrated quite well there that there are clear reputational and commercial benefits to having strong ESG credentials in place. I think the momentum towards developing a positive ESG strategy in all sectors and industries is to a high degree now driven by investors and institutions who are looking to have an ethical dimension to their to their portfolios. And I know that we have um, a couple of fund managers on, on the call. I'd be interested in getting their view later on. But it's fairly clear, I think, from the daily flow of stories about new ESG products being launched, that there is a swell of, in demand for ESG aligned investments. Uh, and this is only going to grow uh, by 2030, Generation Z and millennials are going to make up the, the vast majority of the workforce compared to, to now. And there's research to show that for those groups, ESG values are a significant driver in determining not only who they work for, but where they are going to put their money. Uh, now I'm going to, to have a look at the the regulatory framework, uh, how, how the regulatory framework is evolving, both in the UK and the EU, and what the future might look like for businesses. But just let's begin with, with this slide here on the UN's principles for responsible investment. The, the UN PRI has worked uh, for a number of years to promote the incorporation of environmental, social and corporate governance factors into investment decision making. Uh, with, with a good amount of success. As of January last year, they had 2,300 financial institutions representing, I think, about $80 trillion uh, in assets worldwide signed up and participating to their, to their principles um, and filing reports on their, their ESG progress. The PRI has been arguing since 2006, and of course, the the uh, agenda has changed and the landscape has changed quite a lot since then, but they have been saying that it's financially and ethically irresponsible not to consider the, the environmental impact of a company when you're assessing its merits as, as an investment. And I think the grand swell of opinion is, is behind them now. These principles, I won't go through them individually, but I, I put them up on the slide because I think they're quite a good starting point for crafting an ESG uh, strategy. Um, turning then to the next slide, whereas the, the UNPRI is voluntary, um, and historically, of course, ESG reporting has tended to be more voluntary than mandatory, we are seeing this changing. Regulators are increasingly showing signs of an unease. 
that companies' non-financial disclosures are often incomplete and that they're difficult to compare across companies. I mentioned ratings agencies at the very beginning, but, but ratings agencies are applying different methodologies, leading to quite a variation in how they put together ratings for any given company. And I think uh, I'm right in saying that there were two ratings agencies who had given completely different verdicts on the ESG, um, ESG uh, uh, rating for Tesla. So this sort of inconsistency is causing the regulators to look at how they can, they can work to establish a more consistent ESG reporting framework, primarily, I suppose, to, to protect consumers against greenwashing. I've got a couple of examples there on the slide from the FCA, OJA, the FRC, and uh, the Department of Business and Energy. In, two, in November 2020, the FCA announced its uh, ESG focused framework, which was based on five principles covering consistency in messaging and approach, transparency and uh, measurability of objectives, strategy and the use of high quality ESG data. The FCA's approach to ESG and sustainable investing has really been underscored by what they did in April 2021, uh, a couple, well, last month, when they promoted uh, Sasha Sadan to, I think, the, the first to be the first director of, of ESG. Turning then to, to OJA, um, the Oil and Gas Authority, they have spearheaded an initiative designed to develop good ESG practices in operators' plans and, and daily operations, requiring climate-related information to be included in those um, operators and licensees' financial reports. The FRC uh, Financial Reporting Council has been pretty active in this space too. In January last year, they implemented a new stewardship code. This was targeted at uh, asset managers, pension funds and insurance companies. Um, and it, it included a new principle which required signatories to consider material ESG issues, including climate change, as part of their, their investment strategy, monitoring, um, engagement and voting uh, activities. And in November 2020, um, they released a thematic review on, on climate reporting which provided guidance on relevant risks and how companies might develop appropriate strategies to manage those risks and the opportunities as well. But I think for me, in terms of financial reporting, uh, the FRC's indication that they are prepared to challenge businesses which discuss climate as a risk at the front end of their disclosures but don't mention it in the financial statements at the back end is a sort of key indication because it means that the FRC is, is moving in the direction that it's going to hold companies accountable for the claims they make, the ESG claims that they make. And then finally, um, just that last standard there, the UK standard, um, the British Standard Institute in, in collaboration with the, uh, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Stat Strategy has um, created a new standard on responsible and sustainable investment management. And this sets out requirements for establishing um, and managing the process of integrating responsible uh, and sustainable considerations into investment management. The key thing for me that comes out of that is the principles which this strategy is, is attached to or, or hung on, I suppose, Go governance and culture, strategy alignment, investment processes, and investor rights and transparency. And again and again, this idea of transparency and consistency is going to come out from our presentation. So from, from uh, what the regulators are saying then to, to the actual regulations, and let's step away from the UK to, to Europe on the next slide, there will be a, a bit of an alphabet soup of acronyms uh, in this presentation. And I'm afraid I'm going to give you another one, the SFDR. Um, the SFDR is the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which came into force in March this year. 
It was introduced alongside the taxonomy regulations and the low carbon benchmark regulations as part of a much broader set of ESG regulations under the EU UN's Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the SFDR, along with these other regulations, is an attempt to push around 1 trillion euros into green investments over the next decade. And of course, it also complements the, the Paris Agreement and the European Green Deal. I just want to drill down into what the, the SFDR says and to, to which companies it applies. It applies to what are known as FMPs, uh, financial market participants, defined very widely, but really to mean any sort of professional entity such as a pension fund, asset manager, insurance company, a bank, or um, it could be a venture capital fund, or, or really any entity which offers management or, or financial advice. And these entities under the um, SFDR are required to publish information about their policies and explain how they factor in e ESG risks into their investment decision making processes. Basically, what does that mean? Well, what criteria are these entities using to assess their investments against? And what impact do these investments have from an ESG perspective? Those are the two uh, sort of high level critical questions. The main aim behind the, the SFDR seems to be to prevent uh, greenwashing, but also to address the lack of consistency, there's that word again, in climate related reporting, um, and also to enable firms which, do, which are genuinely offering um, ESG products, sustainable products, to steal a march over their competitors who aren't making so much progress in this field. As far as the technical disc disclosure requirements go, well, they apply to adverse ESG impacts at two distinct levels, um, the entity level and the product level. So at the entity level, FMPs, financial market participants, are required to publish and to maintain on their websites statements about the main adverse impacts of investment decisions on sustainability factors and their due diligence policies with respect to those impacts. If they decide not to, uh, well, if they decide that there isn't any adverse uh, effect, um, they've got to explain why they think that's the case and whether they intend to carry on considering adverse impacts um, as they go along. At a product level, they will have to provide a clear and reasoned explanation of whether a particular financial product has any adverse ESG impact, and if so, how that's the case. And just very briefly, because I don't want to spend too long going into the, to the technical requirements, it is worth just understanding how financial products are categorized under the SFDR. They're categorized uh, under three categories. The first one uh, is, is what's known as light green products. And these are financial products which promote environmental or social characteristics. And then there are dark green products, products which have a, a specific um, sustainability objective. So that could be the reduction of, of carbon emissions. And then those products which don't fall into either of those two categories. I just mentioned at the bottom of this slide the regulatory technical standards which come into force uh, in January next year. This is supplementary uh, legislation which is designed to um, uh, explain the content and give further disclosure um, obligations under the SFDR. So let's just jump back on the next slide to where we see the, the future going in the UK. The EU has passed these two very significant ESG uh, regulations, the Sustainability Finance Related Disclosure Regulation, the SFDR, which we've just discussed, and the Taxonomy Re Regulation. I haven't gone into the uh, Taxonomy Regulation at all, but just as an overview, this is the EU Commission's sort of principal mechanism for addressing greenwashing. Um, it sets out the criteria for determining if an, actual, if an activity is actually uh, 
um, environmentally sustainable and is also going to add to the to the regulatory burden by requiring additional disclosures to the SFDR. But in the UK, because of course with Brexit we're no longer part of the European Union, neither the SFDR nor the taxonomy regulation um, are in force and they're not expected to be imported into UK law either. That said, um, I think it's very important for financial services businesses and other UK companies to still to take account uh, of these regulations and of course other applicable ESG focused regulatory developments. And I say that because um, it's important to remember for UK entities to remember that although the SFDR is directed at uh, FMPs in Europe, um, it will also apply to non-European FMPs which have European connections and to UK FMPs which are providing services into the EU. This means um, that if a UK firm is providing services into the EU, they could be considered uh, an FMP for the purposes of the S SFDR and subject to the uh, reporting requirements under that regulation. Even if a firm has no European connections, it doesn't undertake any marketing in the, in the European Union and its clients don't require compliance with the SFDR. Companies, that company may still be of the view that it's best practice to adopt ESG reporting, um, particularly in light of the approach that the UK government has adopted. The UK government has declared um, of course, very, very topical at the moment that it's going to bring about a green industrial revolution to stimulate recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes, in line with recommendations from um, the TCFD, another acronym, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, an intention to introduce mandatory reporting of climate related financial information by 2025 in the UK. Certain companies, including those with the premium listing on the London Stock Exchange, are already required to provide disclosures within their annual financial reports on how they manage uh, climate related risks and opportunities. And there are different timelines um, for, for different categories of companies. But I think it's, it's pretty clear from this that UK reporting standards are going in the same direction as EU standards. The UK is already a signatory to the Paris Agreement. It has the same net zero targets as, as the EU. And we've already seen from, from what I've just been through with the publication of the FRC thematic review on, on climate reporting in November last year um, and other regulatory developments that the regulators in the UK are pretty hot on this subject. The FRC is an interesting regulator um, in this field, of course, because it's responsible for regulating corporate governance and stewardship in the UK and is therefore pretty, pretty influential. And it stressed in its, in its uh, thematic review the important role of boards, of companies and auditors in helping uh, investors to, to focus on uh, climate related issues and to ensure that the obligations for um, uh, an ethical ESG approach are adopted. Um, in addition to that, there are the sustainability accounting standards boards, um, industry standards. Uh, they were published, I think, back end of 2018, a set of industry standards which identified the minimum a set of ESG topics and metrics for a typical company in an industry. And, and whereas these are mandatory, I think from our perspective, they do give a very good indication of the, the direction that ESG reporting is going in. Well, the exact nature of uh, ESG reporting obligations that apply to any one business is going to be dependent on the, the business's corporate footprint, on the business's particular profile. But it's probably fair to say, I think that financial services firms are bearing the brunt at the moment of the uh, additional ESG reporting requirements. But this is, this is not going to be the case um, forever because 
We've seen that listed companies have additional requirements and indeed any companies uh, which are required to publish accounts in the UK are also being brought into the fold of these, these further ESG reporting requirements. What, what I've tried to illustrate in this last set of slides is that nationally and internationally ESG, uh, uh, the ESG reporting framework has evolved very significantly and it really is only going in one direction. Even beyond corporate governance requirements, there are pretty compelling uh, reputational reasons for putting together an ESG framework, I think. Large, large number of companies, um, as we've seen from Katie, and I think she's going to touch on uh, uh, shortly as well, a large number of companies have already started putting together ESG statements of um, setting up or joining ESG initiatives because they recognize the, the value to their business brand uh, and the potential to attract further investment and, uh, and consumer interest. So on that topic, I will now hand over to Katie, who's gonna look at the practical implications of ESG reporting and how you can begin to structure an ESG framework. Thanks, James. Um, so hopefully what you've taken from this presentation so far is that you know, ultimately businesses are gonna be held accountable for the ESG claims that they make, whether that be in tender documents and contractual documents or in website material. And this will obviously have an impact on businesses. So we've identified four you kind of practical implications that this might have for business. First of all, um, a fairly obvious one is that there might be an additional administrative burden that companies experience. Now this could be around um, recording how ESG risks have been identified and managed within um, investment decision-making processes or financial advice. Um, it could also be um, a, an administrative burden around developing policies about how the entity will actually manage ESG factors. Now, while it's kind of unavoidable that this will be, you know, front-loading of administrative work, hopefully what can be done is if the bulk of the work is done at the outset, it then becomes much more streamlined going forward to ensure that there is ongoing accurate reporting and compliance, but it's something to bear in mind. In addition to the administrative side of things, the reporting requirements we think will ultimately mean that businesses are going to be required to make strategic decisions based around their approach to sustainability. This will come down to a risk assessment of the business the sector operates in and its business partners, and it will also require a realistic view of just how sustainable that business can be. Um, it is, of course, easier for some, depending on what sector they operate in and what jurisdictions they operate in. Now, as James has touched on already with reference to the, the UK regulators and the aims of um, European SFDR, consistency between ESG declarations and how a business actually operates is absolutely paramount. Um, greenwashing will be identified and it will not stand a company in good stead going forward. You know, companies must be able to essentially practice what they preach and interrogate supply chains to ensure that they're not unwittingly undermining all the good work that might be being done domestically. Um, and finally, again, James has touched on this throughout, is transparency. And this applies across the board when it comes to ESG factors, you know, whether it's environmental reporting, remuneration reporting, or diversity reporting, it all ties back to um, unfortunately, the first point about an, an additional administrative burden, you, you've got to make sure that what you're advertising is exactly what you are doing and that, that can be demonstrated to investors, business partners, counterparties and consumers. And while this might seem like a fairly large mountain to climb in, in the first instance, um, there are ways that UK businesses can start to prepare themselves now for what appears to be inevitable reporting requirements. And we're going to look at this from uh, a practical stance. First of all, um, on the next slide, we'll have a look at some of the um, some of the ways that companies can use current reporting requirements to their advantage, and we'll go on to look at some um, some other practical steps that could be taken. But to start with, um, most companies, or certainly all, almost all companies, will be under certain reporting requirements. You know, for example, um, under Section One Seventy Two of the Companies Act businesses are required to submit strategic reports for a financial year 
including statements that describe how the directors of that company have had regard to certain matters set out within this specific section. Now, some of the matters that the statement must cover are things like consequences of any decisions in the long term, the interests of companies' employees, the need to foster companies' business relationships with suppliers, customers, and others. And also, which I think is very interesting, um, the need to act fairly between members of the company. Now, this is just a handful of some of the factors that have to be reported on, but I think it's, it's fairly obvious from these ones that there are ESG aspects or certainly an ESG slant to a lot of them. So if businesses are able to just now get into the habit of collating and reporting on that relevant information, it will stand them in good stead for when it becomes a regulatory requirement. In addition, um, an ESG reporting framework could be incorporated into more general strategic reports and into mandatory greenhouse gas reports, um, which obviously require thought to be given to the environmental impact of a company's um, operations. And as noted already, companies might decide that it's actually best practice to adopt ESG reporting now, albeit not formally required, rather than waiting until later in the day. You know, I think now is a good time for companies to proactively establish procedures around um, data identification, collation, and then presentation. Um, and also, this isn't actually included on the slide, but you know, for some of you listening, you'll have businesses that operate coma sites or who have to report to SEPA. And it might be that through those reports you're already, you're already making, there are ESG type issues incorporated into it. And it's just a case of perhaps identifying and maybe rebranding in your own mind, if not in the actual report, how you think about these things. And then to make it even more practical, if, um, we're, if we're delving into how a company can truly prepare themselves if they want to develop ESG policies and procedures, on the next slide, we've got a uh, or what we think is a helpful diagram um, for how a company might be able to work through the process. So we have the, the three headline stages being uh, creation, implementation, and then monitoring and review. And step one in this diagram is to create a business specific ESG statement that sets achievable quantifiable targets and how they will be achieved. Now this involves at the outset assessing how important ESG is to that specific business the amount of investment that could be made and actually whether or not the business already has a strong, a strong suite of compliance policies and a good social and governance attitude. The process, you know, the process will have to be bespoke. All companies are different, it has different levels of investment available to it, faces different risks. And um, that's largely dictated by the industry, the market that they operate in and supply chain risks. Many organizations, um, will already have invested in ESG, whether or not that's how it's been branded. So it may be as simple as collating all the strands of work that you've already done and giving, um, giving thought to how they can be presented as one unified ESG strategy. And um, I would flag that within the, the ESG statement or the policy, it is really crucial to have targets and to, to have them in a, a quantifiable form because without that, the, the final step of monitoring, of monitoring and reviewing becomes um, particularly difficult or certainly difficult to justify your, your, um, your conclusions. Now, that's not to forget the implementation step, which is, of course, crucial. And this could be done in a number of different ways. It could be that you've identified particular community objectives or community projects, and it's about implementing them, or it could be employee initiatives that need to be rolled out across the business. Um, we'll have a look actually there's on the on the following slide we'll touch on in a second that there's a good example of an employee initiative that's you know relatively easy and maybe not the traditional ESG initiative that you might think of in your mind um, but this also does require a traditional black and white approach to corporate compliance actions you know it might be implementing comprehensive compliance and um, policies procedures training and other strategies to ensure that all employees third parties and contractors are singing from the same hymn sheet and as I've already mentioned, the only way to make sure that all of this is being implemented is to have a robust process for monitoring and viewing um, progress and compliance. Now, responsibility for ensuring that there is a process to do this lies with senior management and there's no way around that. But there's many ways that this can be done. It doesn't have to be done by a director. It could be that they decide to engage um, external auditors to do spot checks or annual reviews. 
And it might be as simple as asking for feedback from employees and third parties to get an idea of how policies and procedures are actually being implemented on the ground. The important point, I think, is that there needs to be a time frame in place for how often you review um, your, your policies and your compliance. And really that depends on the size of, again, size of the business and the risk that they, or the risks that it faces. You know, it might be that it's done annually or it might be quarterly, depending on the resources available and the risks presented. And um, more practically, when it comes to health and safety issues or anti-corruption, it might be that you decide to conduct internal process safety reviews and reports, carry out training and um, publish revenue reports annually to make sure that you have a degree of um, not only transparency, but also progression and improvement. And as I've touched on the next slide, we've got some examples to leave you with, um, partly just as, as interesting things to think about, but also I think it's a good way to, to give an example of how companies are responding to ESG pressures within the market. So I won't go through all of them, but I do know, first of all, um, the second bullet point in this slide is an African inspired health food brand. And it's a social business that's been set up with the, the primary aim of creating sustainable incomes for African households. And that's done by sourcing um, ingredients from small scale producers in Africa and then keeping the profits local to them. They also then keep uh, a cut of the, the product in the community. So not only is it keeping profit local, but it's also ensuring that they have um, the food and the products that they need as well. And then the, the final bullet point is on E.ON, and this is the um, employee initiative that I spoke about earlier. So E.ON have introduced a buzz recognition program that encourages, I mean, I suppose it's the, it's the idea of getting a pat on the back, a virtual pat on the back. Um, and it's essentially personalized employee recognitions via digital, or I suppose physical once we're all back to normal in and offices, um, just thank you notes. And the aim was to cut across hierarchy. So rather than just receiving, you know, praise from a boss down, it could be lateral thanks. It could be, you know, I know that I probably couldn't function without my EA, being able to say thank you to them and cutting across hierarchies in the business. And what Eon found is actually that the, the number of employees feeling valued in their job increased by a huge 39%. And actually employee understanding of the business rose um, from 57% to 75%. So I think this E.ON example is, is really important to flag because ESG initiatives don't have to be, you know, hugely expensive. They don't have to be all bells and all whistles. Um, I think this is quite nice because essentially it's just saying thank you to a colleague, but it obviously has a massive impact on employee engagement and satisfaction. And I think that's an, an important message. Um, ESG strategies can be tailored to the company, the size of the company and the resources available to it. And um, it's not a one size fits all solution. And I will now pass back to Paul to give you some, uh, some takeaway points. Thanks Katie uh, and thanks James also. This slide really could be called the James Katie, James Katie slide because here we're just looking to try and bring together some of the key points from the presentation. I'll also give you a one minute warning that I'll turn to the Q&A um, part of the discussion in a moment. So if you have anything that you want to get off your chest in a constructive way through questions to the group, then this is your last chance to post those. But bringing, bringing this all together, um, you can tell from what James was focusing on that um, financial services and um, investment decisions are going to be a key driver for ESG. Absolutely, but hopefully you're also picking up from um, Katie's part of the presentation that ESG is a cross industry issue. Now that means, yes, it will be the case that investors are looking to see the right performance indicators from businesses across a range of sectors. And that will mean that ESG becomes important, increasingly important to all sectors, but away from investment um, decisions and, and being attractive to investors, Right now, for your sector, for your industry, you will find there's legislation and requirements already in place, which are basically ESG requirements. Katie mentioned modern slavery and, and also um, bribery there. So there, there's already black letter law requirements in the UK requiring you to perform in an ESG minded way. And that's before we see the, the formal introduction of the ESG regulations through the EU and, and laterally, we'll see that in the UK as well. 
So I think that's a key point to take that it's, it's going to be a cross industry um, issue. Yes, it's an option that will become a requirement um, over time. And both James and Katie, uh, and certainly Katie towards the end is making the point that you're going to have a period of time where you can elect to do things, you can choose to do things, but after a period, it'll increasingly be the position that you will have no option but to commit more time to ESG. Now, that sounds, we want to stay positive and the positive message there is that you will already be doing most of, or many of the things which you can repackage or repurpose to demonstrate a commitment towards ESG. And that's one of the key points we'd ask you to take away from today. The slide that we, we built, which is how to do it, is a great slide, but it, we don't mean to do it from scratch. You will have policies, procedures in place already to meet existing commitments that you should be thinking about repurposing and repackaging to demonstrate an ESG um, commitment also. Uh, and being a little bit cynical or practical for a moment as well here, you should be looking to this as an opportunity for to generate a commercial gain for your organi organization as well. If you're able to simply more clearly communicate things you're already doing um, to the market, to consumers, to investors, that should give you a commercial advantage, a commercial gain that you can point to. So try not to view this as a, as a red tape or a box ticking exercise, something that simply has to be done. It, also look at this as an incentive to attract new business, to make your business uh, more attractive to, to others also. Um, so it's more than compliance, as I've said here, it's, it's very much about having a positive story, but it will take strong leadership. You, you do have to uh, not just speak positive words, you're going to have to do a root and branch review of what's happening in the business, uh, as Katie's noted, to make sure that you are confident that you're actually complying with the benchmark or complying with the principles that you've set out there. There's only one thing, well, is it worse? In some ways, one thing worse than doing nothing is saying you'll do something and then, then not doing it because you've set, um, set up a, a rod for your own back there. But our final thought on this, it really, it, at the moment, it's up to you and your organisation. You can decide how much or how little to do. And really important point, there'll be limits to what you can do. As Katie noted, if you're operating in certain sectors, there are certain uh, operating limits you will have. There's only so green or environmentally friendly you can become. Um, if you're operating in sectors where there are certain risks that require to be managed, those risks may not be able to be eliminated, they may have to be managed. So you have to tailor um, an approach which is right for your organisation, but do it in a way which is not making you um, non-competitive or less competitive, but it's a choice for you and your organisation. So some some final thoughts from us there, um, just to summarise, and certainly we can, we can move to look at some of the questions. Um, I'm going to uh, look across uh, and pick up a, a couple of them. The, the first one that's came, came over, um, is a question, what personnel do you need in the organization to deliver ESG? I, I suppose that's pointing partly to the, the idea of having something like an ESG director like the FCA have in place. James, do you want to pick up that first question? Do you need to have sp particular people in place um, to demonstrate compliance or to take ESG compliance forward? That's a, that's a very good question, Paul. I mean, for me, if you do put someone in place who has responsibility, direct responsibility for ESG, that's a very clear statement to the market and to investors of your intent, of your commitment to ESG um, factors. But it, for many companies, will boil down to a resource issue. So I think um, the answer is no, you don't need to put in place someone who has the role, the, the, the title of ESG director. But I think for most companies, even very small companies, they will be wanting to consider whether they've allocated appropriate resource to a person within the company. It might be someone who sits within HR, might be someone who sits within legal or, or, or compliance, who can look at the objectives of the company and determine whether there is a, there is a role for um, creating more of a, an alignment towards ESG factors. Uh, just, just on this, there's, there's, there's one thing that occurs to me, and it's that if a company at the moment is, is not very profitable, 
uh, because of the pandemic or, or for whatever reasons. But they are communicating a pretty robust ESG message, either by having someone in place or having a, an area of their website which focuses on ESG. That's a pretty strong message to investors that they have a long-term future, or at least there's a much greater prospect that they are going to be around in two or three years' time than companies which are sidelining this and not taking ESG factors seriously. Great. Thanks, James. Um, next, before I go to the next question, I'm just noting um, a comment that's come in, uh, not as a question, more as an observation, which I'll, I'll, I'll just flag now um, from the ESG Foundation, uh, explaining that um, they are maintaining a, an archive of ESG reports that, are, that date back to 2016, which is free to view. And what was after the, the session as part of the circulating the follow-up details will, will circulate the, the details to the link to the ESG reports archive. So those attending can look back if that's of interest. Um, the, the next question question, so to speak, is uh, I think hopefully this is a question that was posted before I've started talking about it at the end, or it just means that people had stopped listening by the time I started to speak at the end. It's do you need to have ESG specific policies and procedures in place? Katie, do you want to pick, up, pick that up? Do we need to have policies and procedures that are labeled as ESG? Yeah, I think you had covered it off at the end, Paul. I guess ultimately the answer is no, it doesn't have to be labeled as an ESG policy for it to fall into a broader ESG strategy. So, you know, for example, um, health and safety policies, um, anti-bribery, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, they all fall under the ESG bracket and will most likely already exist in some form within a company's suite of compliance policies. So it's maybe, a, it's maybe more of a case of doing some kind of internal reflection and looking at what you've got already and then bundling the existing policies within a, a broader ESG suite of documents. I think that's maybe the the answer to that one. That, that's a better answer than what I was saying <laughs> on my part, but that makes sense. That, that's really helpful. Uh, next then we have, I hesitate to ask this question because it's taking us back into the, the quagmire of EU and UK uh, and what happens next. And James, you may you may have covered this to an extent, but I'm going to sort of swing it back around to you anyway. And the question is, will, will the UK and the EU eventually align on ESG requirements? That's more of a political question, isn't it, than anything else? Because there is... There's take, a swing, a commercial... take a swing, James. <laughs> There's certainly a commercial um, objective for alignment because it's easier for business if the UK is aligned in, in relation to reporting requirements to, to the EU. I think that, as I think I said, I think that there is, there's lots of evidence that the UK regulators and the EU regulators moving in, in the same direction. And I would, I would hope, I suppose, rather than expect that if you, if you complied with the reporting requirements in the UK, there would be some recognition of that in the, in the EU and vice versa. I think that there is probably pretty limited prospect of them being exactly aligned because of the, the, the political divisions that currently exist between the, well, either side of the channel. Good, that, that's good, James. Um, and that's, a, that's a sufficient enough swing at that answer, I think. <laughs> So um, I, I think there's a couple more questions, but I think what we'll do is we will we'll call things to an end um, now. And when we make the recording available, we'll also make available at that point the complete list of questions and um, some further thoughts from us, just so you can all get an extra five minutes for a cup of tea before you have your next appointment at three o'clock. So thanks all again for attending um, today's session. We hope you found it um, useful. Thanks to Katie and to James for presenting. If you have any follow-up questions for any of the team, you have our details um, on the slides here. You can find us online at um, the Brody's website, of course, also. We'd be delighted to hear from you. But um, until we speak to you again, um, have a great day, everyone. And thanks very much. Goodbye. <laughs>